So really, really excited to see so many people joining us this evening, actually. Um, welcome to the second event in the series of Finance for Ops, brought to you by Operations Nation. Um, we're running this series in partnership with Quantico Financial and Drew Verne, who's Quantico's co-founder and COO, will be shortly kicking off the session. But first, you'll need to bear with me for, for a few minutes until I explain what Operations Nation is all about. Um, I am Oshwina, um, and I want you to meet Askard and Charlene, who you can see on the call here. Um, and like most of you probably, we are ops people. And the three of us, we are all in fairly different stages in our, of, of our operations careers. And we had very, very different paths that led us here. But I think what we all have in common is, um, you know, probably like many of you that were all jacks or jealous of all trades and hopefully master of some as well, or at least getting there. Um, but we, we've almost, um, not we've almost, we've mostly learned um, our trade by learning from our uh, from our ex or from experience from making mistakes from uh, learning from those mistakes and um in a true ops mindset i guess we we wanted to scale that learning experience so a couple of years ago between the three of us we kicked off two communities for operations leaders uh, which many of you here are a part of uh sub stories and cohort um and you know, a lot, a lot of you here are fueling these communities that uh, by creating a lot of value for each other by sharing your challenges and advice with one another. And that is really, really awesome. Um, but when Astrid, Charlie and I met for the first time, we wanted to uh, figure out a way how to share this operations awesomeness with more people um, and how to make it more accessible to everyone beyond the ops communities that, that we're running and also to shine a light on operations um, as a discipline and as um, an area to work in because I'm sure you will all agree that it's a very, very interesting job to have. Um, so we start to build Operations Nation. It is a platform for ops people by ops people and it is a place that you can call your own, hopefully, um, it is a one-stop shop for every operations person. And we are just starting out, so keep an eye on what is coming. Um, keep an eye um, on LinkedIn, on Eventbrite. Um, sign up on our uh, mailing list um, as well on operationsnation.com um, because we're going to have many, many more things coming, many um, events like this, um, and hopefully more resources, um, more articles to come. Um, and the reason why we started Finance for Ops um, series is, is fairly simple, actually. And um, if, you know, for those of you who have been to the last event um, um, as well, we feel that finance is one of the core tools in the Ops toolkit. And especially with COVID-19, it's, it's never really been more important to keep an eye on the company's finances. Um, plus, we have Drew Verne, co-founder of um, NCO of Quantico who has agreed to be our event and our content partner and partnerships always make everything 100% better, right? Um, so together with you, Vern, today, we are also joined by Abby. Uh, so Abby is a financial controller at Stashby um, and uh, she also previously um, worked at Octopus Investments. And Abby will be sharing her best practices when it comes to capturing accurate data. And I'm super excited to hear um, more about that. Um, and just before we start, um, I just wanted to, uh, to give you a couple of house, housekeeping rules. Um, everyone's probably used to Zoom by now, so I'm not going to get into more uh, into much detail, but um, two things. So first of all, you can use a chat function, which you've already been using, to say hi and, and raise any tech issues. Fingers crossed that we're not going to have any. And um, we will be using the Q&A function to gather all your questions in one place. So please submit them as we go. Um, you don't have to wait until the Q&A session in the end. Um, and you can also comment your question or upvote um, other people's question. Um, and we will answer them in the last half an hour of the event. Um, all right, and I guess like one final shout out is, um, is to Quantico, who is, um, who is, like I said, our event and content partner. Um, and I'll hand it over to Juvern 
now to tell a little bit more about Quantico and kick off the session. Great. Um, thanks, Osrina, um, for the introduction. So hi, everyone. I'm Juven, co-founder at Quantico, where we basically provide growing, ambitious startups in London uh, with an in-house finance team. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And as a result of that, I guess, um, as part of my uh, and from prior experience of having worked in lots of startups as well, I've seen many things that can go wrong in terms of capturing accurate data. So let's get right into it, I guess. So Osrina, as my slide um, coordinator, would you like to go on probably the next slide? <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Great. Um, so let's get started, I guess. Um, so I thought what would be helpful, um, even before we start thinking about, you know, how we might go about capturing accurate data, is actually what the key terms are. So the first one I wanted to kind of really quickly introduce is this, and you must, I'm sure you've heard it lots, is this idea of accruals. Um, and what it means and how it compares to cash accounting. So very simply, accruals is when the service is rendered. And cash, I think cash is pretty self-explanatory. So cash is literally when it leaves and when it arrives in the bank account. Um, so to give you a very quick example, I suppose. So a contractor has got an invoice that's dated the 1st of January, but they've actually rendered your services in December. So under a cash basis, you would recognize that probably, maybe say on the 15th, which is probably when you pay the contractor, but on a accruals basis, you would want to make sure you recognize that in December because that's when the services were rent was actually rendered. So you will hear that quite a lot. Um, accountants definitely are very big on this whole accruals accounting. You might hear us say things like, please, can you accrue for this? Can you let me know what I need to accrue for? So um, it's a terminology I'm sure you've heard many, many times. Um, and following on from that, um, you've got what is considered to be um, another um, quite common accounting term, which is what it's called the matching principle. So very simply, what that means is when you record revenue, all the related expenses should also be recorded at the same time. And the reason why this is important really is so that you have an accurate picture of how your business is actually doing. Um, and in taking the example of an e-commerce business right there, you know, um, you might purchase like the inventory like three months before you actually sell it, but that's not very helpful to actually understand what the gross margins of the business is. In fact, um, what you need to be doing is to recognize the cost of a t-shirt when you actually sell the t-shirt. Um, and I've kind of, and to do that properly, you have to track inventory. So that's another kind of core principle, um, accruals um, and matching principle. And when you, once you've got that nailed, to be honest, that is basically accounting 101 done and sorted, assuming you understand those core principles. And then following on from that, um, this is actually quite a big one here, which is cash movements versus net profit. So this is actually quite, um, I find this to be honest, quite a challenging one to explain to people, you know, um, and to be honest, actually quite difficult to work out as well sometimes. So the, the question I oftentimes have to answer is, why is my bank balance fallen by 100K, but it's only been a 50K loss in those accounts, you know? Um, and the reason why that's the case is because there's cash accounting and accruals accounting is two very different concepts. Cash, we all understand, is literally just when the cash comes in and when the cash goes out. But net profit is obviously done on the accruals basis. And some of the reasons you know, that why that might be the case would be things like prepayments. And prepayments would be things whereby, you know, where you've got a HubSpot annual subscription, for example. Um, and obviously that's an annual subscription, which means that we have to prepay it and by which I mean we have to spread that cost across 12 months. Um, also, uh, we may be paying a rent deposit and a rent deposit doesn't actually hit the P&L because it's not actually a cost. It's gonna be um, an amount that you're gonna get back from the landlord at some point in the future. So that's gonna obviously reduce your bank balance, but it's not actually gonna affect your profit and loss. And the most common one, I guess, is basically um, late receipts from revenue. I say that by which I mean, um, you might recognize the revenue in say the month of Jan, but you may not receive the money until say March. So your profit has gone up by say 10,000 pounds, but your cash hasn't changed at all. And that's basically three reasons why that might be the case. Uh, you might hear again, accountants or your finance team talking about, oh, how do we reconcile cash back to net profit? Um, or how do we, um, let's figure out why the profit and loss statement, like why the movements in the profit and loss might be so different from the cash movement. And that's, those are the reasons. Um, and it's also obviously quite important because it's actually, um, as with most startups, cash is quite tight. 
So it's obviously quite important to track cash quite closely in addition to tracking your profitability. Um, so that's cash movement versus net profit. And then moving on to month end, um, this is a very um, finance team, um, I guess, uh, term, I suppose. And, and the reason why, uh, and, and we basically almost live and die um, with month ends, definitely. And you would definitely hear finance teams talking about, oh, we got to close this month end. I'm really sorry, I can't talk to you right now because like, we're trying to close month end. And you would typically hear that in the first week of, of the month. So if you want to be nice to your finance teams, try not to bug them in the first week of the month. Uh, because typically that's when month end happens. Um, and month end really here is, you know, um, just the, the, the process, I guess, in, in finalizing the accounts for the previous month. So say for like the month of March, um, the first week of April would typically be dedicated to closing month end. Um, however, um, there's something that you might want to know about month end. Oftentimes we have very tight deadlines because of investor meetings or, you know, specific reporting deadlines. So we may have to make estimations as well, because otherwise, like, you know, the actual amounts, like we just won't know until two weeks later, for example, but like, you know, but like the deadline was two weeks ago. So, so we sometimes have to make estimations as well. But that again is probably something that you hear a lot about, but know that finance teams kind of live and breathe by month ends. Um, and then um, the next bullet point, I thought I'll just kind of quickly introduce you to some abbreviations, I guess, that you would again commonly hear and we love our abbreviations. I think it's our way of making it seem like it's really difficult. Um, so we've got AP, which stands for accounts payables. Might be familiar with that. AR, accounts receivables. BS, balance sheet. FAR, fixed asset register. COGS, or COS, or cost of sales. TV, a trial balance, which is basically double entry bookkeeping. That means that everything always balances to nil. GL, uh, we like to use GL a lot, but really what we mean here um, is general ledger. And really what it means here is just a list of account categories um, where you might actually quote certain expenses to. And then finally, debits and credits, which is what um, the kind of basic accounting is to make sure everything balances. And then the final bullet point here is about prepayments, which I mentioned before. Like So an annual subscription to HubSpots, for example, is about the kind of spreading the cost across a period of time. And then this concept of depreciation, which is really the same kind of concept with prepayments. What it means here is that you, when you buy a computer, what you don't want to be doing is recognizing the spend of the computer all for just the one month. What you really want to be doing here is actually spreading that cost across a period of time um, because you want it to reflect the actual use, useful life of that um, equipment. So really same kind of concept, two different names because it applies to basically two different things. Depreciation applies to fixed assets um, and prepayments typically apply to either software subscriptions, could also be kind of events that you pay upfront um, before the actual event happens. Uh, and those are the kind of few common ones. Great, next slide. Excellent. And before even getting started on, you know, um, what capture, how you can go about capturing accurate data, I thought it would be a good idea to actually lead on um, where things could go wrong. Um, and before I even start with that, actually, you would notice that like I have done revenue and accounts receivables, for example, um, and expenses and accounts payables, equity and fixed assets. Um, you might or might not know this, but like AR, AP, equity and fixed assets are all in the balance sheet. Um, and this is the, the dirty little secret, I guess. Um, you can hide a lot of things in the balance sheet. Um, people don't pay enough attention to balance sheets. Um, a lot of people like focusing on a P&L because that's what everyone's very familiar with. You know, you say revenue, everyone gets what revenue is, everyone gets what, you know, cost of sales is, everyone gets what expenses is. Um, but actually, if you know your way around accounting systems, like, it's actually very, very easy to make your financials look a lot rosier than it actually is uh, without being caught um, because you can hide things in the balance sheet. To kind of give you an example, um, I was previously in a startup where we overstated cash by about 200K. And that's because um, there was some very funky account categorizations there that was hiding in the balance sheet. Um, and then as a result, and that actually had a very material impact because it meant that our runway was cut by about two months as a result of not knowing what actual cash is. 
So that would be my biggest kind of, if, if anything, that would be the biggest takeaway is that the, you need to pay attention to your balance sheet. The PL um, is really just a difference in the balance sheet. You probably don't know what that means, but once you do the debits and credits entries, like that is literally what it is. Um, the PL is just a difference. All right, so let's kind of walk through this table here. So it's always really helpful to kind of, when you think about things that could go wrong, to think about what the impact might be. So I've kind of really kind of, the way I think about it is to think about what the impact might be in terms of whether we're overstating it or understating it, or in some instances, like literally having no idea at all. Because obviously, like you, if you're finding out that you're overstating revenue, you're going to have to take some quite uh, drastic steps to make that happen. And if you're understating or overstating expenses, again, you know, you might want to, again, take dramatic steps on that. So obviously, overstating expenses is less material than understating expenses. Um, that's why it's also good to make that distinction as well. I've been in, in cases before where I've kind of gone into a new business and, you know, and it turns out that they've been overstating expenses. Um, and when, when we went to the board meeting the next month, it looked like we've like, you know, made a profit. Um, but actually, we've only um, basically overstated expenses because of really poor record keeping. Um, but because it's overstating expenses, people kind of get a fake... Um, like they they feel like it's 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 they feel um oddly really happy about it because it's a bit like finding out that um you're finding out that you you've got this extra cash which is not the case um so when it's understating expenses it's it's good that you've spotted it but less of an issue but if you've over so if you're overstating it it's less of an issue but if you're understating it obviously that's gonna that's gonna have severe repercussions on on business planning Great. So in terms of um, yeah, like the categories that I've kind of put together, so um, a common reason why revenue and correspondingly accounts receivables might be overstated is because VAT isn't accounted for. So VAT is it's a very fiddly topic. So I'm not even get, going to get into it, but just know that you know that depending on what services and products that you offer, um, you probably have to account for VAT. Uh, it's very easy to pretend that VAT doesn't exist, but VAT is a huge thing. Um, so that's probably quite likely if you're just recognizing uh, on a cash basis that you might not be doing it correctly. Um, the other common reason why that might be overstated is because the revenue isn't spread correctly. So for example, um, a salesperson might have booked 100K revenue. Um, and in effect, what that means is they raised, or we've, the finance team has raised a sales invoice for 100K. But actually, when you dig into it, you know, 100K isn't obviously for the month. It's actually for three months or for a whole year. Um, and if all we've done is just booked it in March, for example, then we're overstating revenue because it should have been spread out for, the, for 12 months, basically. Um, and then in terms of uh, why you might be understating revenue, um, commonly, that's because we're only recognizing it when the cash is collected. So we may have actually sold the service, but the cash isn't received until a month later. So really we're understating revenue. The other reason as well is that we're only, again, this is again to do with cash accounting, we're only accounting for the net amount. So again, something I've seen very frequently, um, you might have money coming in from Stripe, but obviously Stripe only deposits the net amount. Um, and if you only then recognize the net amount as revenue, then you're understating it because the net amount obviously includes the fees that Stripe has already deducted. Um, and finally, you just have no idea. You literally just don't know whether you're overstating or understating. Um, and a reason that I've come across is that you just, money's been taken out from Stripe, but you don't know whether it's for annual subscriptions, quarterly, yearly, or, or, or monthly subscriptions. No idea what period it's for. Um, so that obviously is not a good thing to be in if you don't even know what the quantum of difference is. Um, but that would be one reason as to why that might be the case. Um, moving on to expenses and accounts payables um, and why you might be overstating us. And this is basically the most common reason uh, why expenses are being overstated. Um, and it's to do with how um, some people integrate Receipt Bank into zero, whereby receipts are being published, but they're not being reconciled correctly. And I have seen this a few times now where um, because you know, like because of the integration that's happening and because it's not been set up correctly, you then have the situation where like you're double counting things. And as a result of that, like, you know, you're just, uh, you're just overstating expenses quite significantly. Um, understating it could be things around like your bank feeds, for example. 
So typically bank feeds like credit card bank feeds might not be up to date. So I, for example, Amex is a little bit frustrating for the past few months because Zero hasn't yet um, set up the feed yet. So you might just not have the latest information coming in from the bank. And that'll be one of the common reasons as to why you might be understating it. And if you have no idea, chances are you haven't actually reconciled the actual bank statement to what's in Zero. So here again, I would um, definitely be a bit more um, cautious. There are instances where the bank feed isn't up to date or even correct. I have again seen many instances where the zero bank feed has just completely missed out a whole, whole day or a few days um, for no reason at all, to be honest. And it happens more frequently than I would like. Um, so it's very helpful and, and pretty important actually to do it on a monthly basis. But all you need to do is just check the bank balance in zero and then the bank balance in the bank itself, just to make sure they're correct. Because if they're not, then there's obviously missing transactions there. Um, cool. Moving on to equity, um, why you might be overstating equity. So equity is probably one of the areas that I know a lot of people probably don't spend too much time thinking about. Uh, as a result of that, it's also the area where um, you make a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. I've had to go in and, you know, um, go back in time, 10 years actually in one instance for a client um, to basically fix the equity position. Uh, and the reason was because nobody was tracking it. Investors were paying some money um, and they were all being coded into quite random accounts. So nobody really knew. And people just kind of took the investor's word, basically, that everything's been transferred across correctly. Um, maybe so, but like, um, it, it's always good to check. Um, and this is where, like, you know, for example, where you might be overstating it might be where, you know, you've included some loans in there when it shouldn't be, a, uh, when it shouldn't be an equity. Um, and actually more commonly, you just didn't account for FX, basically. So you might have an instance where the investors actually invested in USD, but actually, um, but they, because your bank account is in GBP, um, the money obviously come in, came into the account as a GBP um, balance, and that has just repercussions on how the balance sheet is recognized. Similarly, if you're understating it, that's also the same kind of idea where you didn't account for FX as well. Um, and the most common of all, people have no idea um, and the reason why uh, startups tend to have sometimes have no idea what that might be or whether you're overstating or understating is because they don't have a register of members, they don't have a cap table. Um, maybe they have a cap table, but definitely not up to date. So they have no idea what's in equity. Um, again, uh, this happens a lot more common than I, would, <laughs> than I would like to admit basically across quite a lot of businesses. So definitely something to kind of get to grips with. So another area, again, part, uh, partly because no one ever really looks at it, is fixed assets. For most of you, um, if you're a software business, this might not be that big a deal. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's probably worth just you know, having an awareness of it. So the reason why you might be overstating this most commonly is because you've never depreciated it. And what I mean by that is you may have bought the computer 10, like, you know, 10 months ago, um, but instead of actually spreading the cost across that 10 months, um, or, or say across two years, which is the lifetime of the laptop, for example, um, you just haven't done any of that. So then you have this you know, amount that's sitting in the balance sheet there, which is a bit too high. Um, understating it could be because you're not even adding things into the register. So you're not even really tracking it, basically, which is also not ideal. Um, and then most commonly, you have no idea at all, because um, there's no system whereby you don't know what, how many laptops have been sent out, you don't know how many chairs, tables that you have, and you just have no way of tracking it, which is also quite a common problem that quite a few startups that I work with have had. Uh, great, next slide, please. Um, and really, I mean, you know, um, as you can imagine, like garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, so if the fund, like I pull out the kind of two main outputs that I, um, that a few people have asked for, which is basically like, you know, an investor reporting template and also live dashboards. And, you know, if the, if the fundamentals are not correct, um, the fanciest investor templates just mean nothing. Um, and in fact, the most common mistake I've seen here is where the investor reporting um, are somehow numbers that have been made up and don't even reconcile to any of the underlying data. And I've again seen it too many times now where revenue, according to this investor reporting that someone's produced, says 10,000 pounds. But when you ask to actually drill back down, you know, what actually makes up that 10,000 um, pounds? Some people find it quite hard to produce that information um, because 
um, they haven't produced the information um, based on underlying data. Um, and then again, similarly with live dashboards as well. If the inputs are coming from different places, uh, chances are they will they probably don't reconcile. So again, see this very often. Uh, you would have revenue that the sales team would be talking about because that's the number that they see in Salesforce and that somehow has no resemblance with what the finance team has got, which is the revenue that they see in zero. Um, and I've put that, I put reconciliation as a solution, uh, which some of you might think, what does that actually mean? Uh, and let me try to explain what I mean by that. Um, so for example, revenue, which is obviously quite an important um, thing to track. The first reconciliation you have to do, actually, the most important one is just tracking this against the cash. Because to be honest, anyone can say they've actually reported 100K in revenue. But like, how does this actually tie out to the cash received? So the cash to revenue reconciliation is probably one of the most important things that you want to be doing. So that's revenue. Uh, what about expenses? Um, how can we make sure that all the costs are accounted for? Um, what about invoices that were received after month end? Because chances are some of the invoices you received month end might actually relate to the month itself. Um, we can accrue for the cost, but how do we know if, if we've over accrued or if we've under accrued? Um, and that's where the, the finance team and yourself would probably need to do a balance sheet rec. Uh, what about balances in the payroll accounts, such as for PAYE and wages? Again, again, commonly neglected. So I see a lot of balances there that doesn't really make sense. But here, you, know, you wanna check and you wanna reconcile to an external report. So how does this tie out to a payroll report? And actually, going back to revenue as well, how much, you know, it's not just about kind of reconciling to cash as well, but you also want to make sure you reconcile it back to, you know, the CRM system that's used in addition to, in addition to Stripe and, you know, or GoCart, whatever um, payment system that you use that is. Great, uh, next slide. So I know all I've done at this stage here is tell you what could go wrong um, and I think it's human tendency to want to know what the actual solution is. Uh, to be clear, I've pointedly called this slide solutions, uh, sorry, systems rather than solutions, um, because the reality is um, the solutions are gonna look very different uh, depending on your tech stack and systems. There is not gonna be one size fits all. My hope is that by telling you everything that could go wrong, I've at least um, you know, educated you on some of the areas that you may not even be looking at. Um, because only when you know what has gone wrong would you be able to find a solution that would actually solve for it. Um, and also, I'm sure you've had lot, lots of ops people of experience in this. Implementing a tech system isn't going to somehow magic the problems away if you know the underlying data is just incorrect and if you have really rubbish processes to begin with. If your sales team isn't talking to the finance team, I mean, you can have the most amazing CRM system, um, but it's just not going to, the numbers are just not going to tie up. And again, have seen this happen a bit too many times. Um, so a system might help the sales team, but like that system can't then solve um, what is then being reported to um, to the investors or, or to the to the investors by the finance team. Um, so instead, what I've done here is listed down a really few quick solutions that uh, you would have maybe seen before and kind of talk through it. So um, which are really affordable and quite easy to get started. Uh, I'll be quite happy to share uh, at Quantico, we've also got a finance handbook as well, where we detail a lot more software. So um, I'll be quite happy to share that with everyone else as well. Um, so you've got a whole list that you want, you can refer to, but just know that like, you know, a system is only one part of like solving for the solution. Uh, first, you have to find the problem before you can even solve for it. So to kind of just do a quiz whiz through about, you know, like the systems out there, zero, I, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is a very popular choice among the UK startups. Lots of integrations, very easy to get started. Uh, by means, not perfect, um, especially if you're growing that sweet, um, uh, sorry, especially if you're growing as well, you might find that zero isn't gonna be a good fit and like you might wanna start consider, uh, considering a website, uh, um, another accounting system like NetSuite, for example, but it's definitely a good place to start at 30 pounds a month, like there's not much you can lose. Um, so obviously a good place to start. Uh, Receipt Bank, uh, solid choice. However, HubDot, which has been acquired by Zero, is now um, an add-on that's included as part of your Zero subscription. So if you don't want to pay for Receipt Bank, um, HubDot could be a good one for you, or HubDot as part of Zero could be a good one for you to try as well um, with it. So Plio would be another one as well that I would recommend looking at in addition to Sodo and Spendus um, if you want to encourage decentralized spending. 
Clio is quite affordable, um, but less sophisticated in terms of its approvals process than Spendesk. Uh, Stripe, the one thing I wanted to point out actually is that it's got um, quite a cool feature called Stripe Sigma, which lets you run SQL reports, which I find to be really handy um, because that way you can kind of run revenue reports off the back of it as well, according to your exact parameters. Um, and then finally, the one that some of you might be aware of, but this is quite a good one, um, which is basically a Google Sheets and Xero QuickBooks integration. Um, any, so any kind of numbers that you've got in Xero um, can be fed into, um, into this integration um, so that your Google Sheets um, tab, I guess, uh, would be automated. And then obviously you can kind of manipulate that to, um, to drive your investor templates. Great, uh, um, next slide. And I believe um, that's actually all I've got to share. Um, so Abby, why don't you take it away and tell us more about how, you know, how things are at Stashby and how, what your best practices are. Perfect, thank you, Juven. So yeah, really good, helpful summary that I think um, could have saved even um, finance people a lot of headache at the beginning of their journey. So um, thank you very much for running through that content. Um, and thank you for the wider team at Operations Nation for putting together such a great event. Um, really, really interesting content. Um, so I thought I'll quickly touch on um, my career and experience just so that I can bring it together in terms of the three points that I've highlighted today. So I started my career in um, FTSE 100 companies and quite often worked where there's a, an entire team that would be reconciling trading data and a commodities trader to um, to the, um, the profit and loss in terms of the finances. Um, and so I've seen at quite a large scale um, how key the operations team is to, um, to, to enabling that, that accurate data to be captured. Um, but then all the way through to founder-led businesses, fast-growing businesses, um, and also um, now at Stashby. Um, and so I just wanted to touch quite briefly on three themes that I think are helpful. None of them are anything new um, but I think it's helpful in a session like this to kind of go back to the basics um, and use it as a good point a good refresher um, to keep in mind some of the things that we, we need to um, revisit so the first one I've touched on is one source of the truth and I'm pretty sure for anyone working in finance or operations um, and taking care of the finance function if I were to ask everyone to put in you know how many conversations are you having around a meeting um, around a, a meeting room or more likely now um, a conference session where three different people have different data sources and we're trying to come to a decision point but um, my idea of customer numbers versus um, the sales team idea of customer numbers are slightly different or my version of revenue versus the version of revenue used for a commission payout is slightly different. So I think just having that principle in mind of that one source of the truth it's never going to be um, an easy task to always be able to achieve it. And I think, Juven, you touched on it in your, you know, your reconciliations. Um, so I think as you're identifying those places where you have data discrepancies, making sure you're capturing them and you've got a, um, a plan of action in terms of how you're going to resolve them. I have actually come across quite large companies where the one source of the truth principle isn't embedded in terms of culture and people can end up deviating further and further away and at some point in time it will become a big enough problem that means um, there's an almighty reconciliation to perform so you're better off tackling things um, in turn as they crop up rather than it escalating to a point where it's really really tricky and really difficult to unpick the second point um, I wanted to touch on, and I'm sure Juven probably have had, um, she'll have a lot more to, um, to share sitting on the other side of the fence, is particularly in the startup world, and if you're someone in operations who's also responsible for finance, you're likely to have um, a support team that you're working with, and the packages and service levels can vary quite widely. But um, just making sure you're thinking about um, and prioritizing how you engage with the finance team that's supporting you. Um, the finance team, um, especially if they're an external finance team, can only do so much without your input, without your guidance, without the context of what the business is doing, you know, the decisions that are happening on a day to day basis. And so it's just making sure that you really take ownership as that custodian 
because you're almost like a translator where you know they might be qualified accountants with years and years of experience but reading the data um, in isolation and without the um, the corresponding context um, without without the wider business um, impact in mind sometimes can be challenging and it can mean that things can fall between the cracks so if for example you know you send your external accountants a set, a set of csv files or excel files or google sheets files um, for them to complete the month end quarter end or annual accounts there needs to be someone internal who understands how those numbers come together because the person the the, the finance team that's supporting you can obviously ask you questions to try and unpick um, the information that they need um, but it's just making sure you're also meeting them halfway and prioritizing your contributions to that to that great outcome in capturing accurate data at the end of the day and then the final point um, that I wanted to touch on hopefully um, when we come to the q a if, if anybody has questions about each of these and and you know at what point do you focus on on each of them we can touch on on it in a bit more detail but I think especially if you're working in a startup um, it's going to be a constant juggle between finding a nice slick long-term solution versus what I would call a hacky or a scrappy solution or a quick fix a kind of band-aid or a plaster that you're putting over a problem um, <clears throat> so that's going to be a constant juggle that people working in a startup will face and I think um, it's one thing to acknowledge that then the second point is right so so how do I balance those two things and I think what we all need to be doing is constantly reassessing the time and costs associated with the um, quick fix solutions that we're putting in place I think a lot of the times what you you know the solution you came up with last year might might have transitioned and now you're finding that actually you know your founders are spending you know three or four hours every month combing through a particular report and trying to piece it together and trying to figure out how to join the dots whereas maybe the year before it, it wasn't as much of a problem so you're reassessing as a business how much is it costing us to have this data discrepancy how much is it costing us um, to not have that single source of truth um, and you're using that information to help you to reassess when is the right time to come up with a, a better solution that has um, longevity and that can last a bit longer. Um, I think it's also helpful to keep scale in mind. It's the same dilemma of um, we don't always have unlimited resources, we don't always have budget to throw out the problem, um, but we do need to be constantly thinking about there are some problems that are okay for now and I know it's going to be a bigger problem later and there are other problems that actually they need to be resolved now because in a year's time or two years time the amount of um, time and effort it would take to unpick it just makes it um, it just it's going to make it such a, a bigger exercise that it should be tackled head-on as soon as possible. The other thing um, I thought I'll just share on this theme of um, you know the slicker long-term solutions versus a quick fix is that particularly if you're the ops person looking after finance and you have an idea that longer term this might be transitioning to a first finance hire i've been um it's been a pleasure joining the stashby team and actually there was quite a lot of documentation around here are the problems that we know are here um that we haven't fixed yet but we we've documented them so even if you're as you're going through and you're coming across um, the areas that Juven touched on in her section of the presentation where there's a reconciliation to perform on fixed assets, on your revenue, on your um, commission payouts, or on your cap table. Um, if you can't get to it, still document it. And when I say document it, it doesn't need to be you know, a 10 page letter, um, even a Trello board with a can't get to it right now, but must look at it later type of um, list can be really useful so that at least if someone is coming in it's not um, as though those things haven't been thought about it's just the fact that there are um, constraints on time and there are constraints on resources and they haven't been um, tackled yet but it gives the person coming into the role whether it's another um, operations hire or another finance hire it gives them a really helpful picture of the lay of the land and then they can um, take that data take everything that you've documented 
and can perform their own assessment of which ones need to be the top priority, which ones can come next, and they'll feel a lot more comfortable about what they're tackling because it's no, they're the known knowns rather than the unknowns, um, if that makes sense. So that's my brief um, summary of um, a few key themes in terms of best practice. So one source of the truth as an underlying principle, it doesn't happen automatically and we have to accept in some cases it won't be possible, but just keeping it as a true north, that that's ultimately um, what we're working towards, it's ultimately what the aim is, and challenging people when um, they start to diverge and decide, and you can, you can quite easily get reporting silos where a particular um, department wants to use a number and isn't interested or they, they don't feel incentivized to work together to achieve that one source of the truth. So I think, um, you know, whether you're in, you're in ops or you're, you're you know, ops and finance, I think that's a key role that you can play in, in communicating the value and um, bringing that cohesion with data. Um, engaging with your external finance teams, making sure you understand your role in delivering accurate finance, um, accurate data, uh, for the business metrics and for the financials and annual accounts um, and then also constantly reassessing have I chosen the right approach to these problems um, when I'm choosing between a quick fix for now and a longer term solution that we can scale. I hope that helps. Amazing. Abby, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, I really, really love your last um point specifically about putting everything in the travel board and i think i'm just going to go and do that um as soon as possible um we're going to q a time right now and we have a question from leah um Javern, maybe ooh, i'm just gonna put my video on as well um i'm, I'm definitely not the person to answer this but Javern, maybe you want to <laughs> tackle this one yeah, no, it's actually quite a long question, so um, I'm going to read it out um, um, by Leah. So I think to just paraphrase the question, um, the context is that it's a business that has recurring con customer payments, um, and the question is around like how do you analyze and present data sets relating to failed late customer payments for those in ops? And the objective here is are there any trends? Um, because if they are, this would support an ops requirement for the devs to build um, a system that can better monitor customer failed payments, um, thereby making things more efficient. So my question, so to kind of have a first step at answering this, I guess, um, in terms of monitoring failed payments, um, actually tools like Stripe and I think GoCardless as well are actually pretty good um, at doing that. So for example, I mentioned that with Stripe, there's actually Stripe Sigma where you can do that. But even, even ignoring that actually, um, um, in terms of late customer payments, assuming this is, I think you mentioned this is recurring, um, Stripe actually automatically re, um, takes these payments as well to automate a lot of this so that you don't have to chase people, I guess. And similarly, in Go Cardless as well, um, they should, when I've previously done this before, um, you should be able to run a very simple report um, that just has a status failed um, and then just obviously set a calendar reminder for yourself to check it. And that should then, you know, give you the, the list basically but um, if anything when again previously where I worked before like uh, what we then did with the desk was actually set it up so that every time there was a there was a failed payment that would then obviously send a web hook to the, the team to the dev team to then take payment again or that would then activate I've seen other workflows whereby that activates like a Salesforce notification so like the sales team would then know that this customer has failed to pay this amount um, so that the account manager can now chase this up as well. I don't know if that answered your question, I guess. Um, so, because we talked about a data set, so just let me know. Um, and if you want to just kind of paraphrase that. Um, Abby, did you have anything else to add to that? No, I think it's a really, really good point. Um, and I, I think um, it's just, a, it's a great question in terms of monitoring the trends um, and understanding how failed payments are impacting on your business. One of the things you touched on was just how you extract data from Stripe so that you know, if the data is already available um, there in terms of historics, um, I think that's something great to make use of. Um, but other than that, I think it, it, it does depend on what the data sources are in terms of how you pull that together. Cool. Um, so I'll read the next question as well. 
uh, yes, this is quite a, <laughs> it's quite a, a broad one, but basically um, anything about best practices on month then. Um, Abby, do you want to kind of kick start this one? What are your, given that you've just kind of gone and talked about best practices, I guess, but specifically on month end, what have you got to share? <laughs> so one of the things that I, I did when starting this new role is um, quite intentionally kept the month end timelines tight. And it meant that um, it's a push to achieve it, but it keeps everyone in mind in terms of how quickly you should be able to turn, turn things around. And so even if there are a few things that don't quite land on time, um, the messaging is clear around, you know, within the first week of the month, you, you need to have a pretty good idea of where you are across all of your key financial, financial metrics. Um, so that, that's probably one of those broader themes and not the, the specifics. Um, one thing I always do is have a clear month and timetable um, with roles and responsibilities, tasks that need to be performed, um, because naturally there will usually be elements of your month end um, that touch on other parts of the business, whether that's um, the sales team need to finalize all of their, um, their sales before the end of the month so that you can start that next part of the process, whether it's a bonus scheme or structure that needs to get signed off at a particular point. There are usually a number of dependencies and calendar invites are helpful, but having just a really basic um, summary that outlines all of the tasks, because some, if someone's got a small task, sometimes they don't always see the impact it has um, on them being a day late or two days late. Um, and so sharing the, the fuller picture sometimes help people understand, right, oh gosh, she's got 20 things to get through. And even though that five minute job you know, um, I feel like I can put it off. Actually, that's the one thing preventing the rest of the, the items to get started. Yeah, no, I'm not yeah. entirely sure. Yeah, so I was going to say, I'm not sure if it's um, more in terms of the doing of the month then. So if, if the person wants to add a bit more detail or um, Jovan, if you've got a few things to, to contribute as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I think the, the best practice about month then is first, like make sure it doesn't take forever. Um, so you've got to have it very tight. Um, and then the second is, I think what Abby said, like setting very clear expectations as well as to who does what at what time. So like run it really tight, like a process. So we like in first for ourselves, because we run month end for lots of different clients. So we actually use um, process suite, which is a very, it's a process management software where it's super clear as well what the dependencies are as well. You may not want to go down that route. I mean, a Google sheet might help, um, but it's like literally if everyone knows what they're meant to do and at what time that would just make the whole process a lot smoother. Where it fails is where like you have like undefined deadlines and then you get to the middle of the month and like the management team starts like kicking up a big fuss about like, hey, like where's my management account? And that's because you didn't set the expectations, you know, two weeks prior or just generally like what that is. A lack of process is the, literally the, the downfall to running a slick month end for sure. And just one more thing to add, I guess, as you start to scale, also make sure you're reviewing that, that task list regularly, because what can happen with some businesses is you carry things over. Um, and, and so a particular task needed to be completed because we didn't have, you know, maybe a, a, an automated process on the side. And if you then bring in people supporting you who don't understand why they're doing the task, you just continue to perform the same task without, without reviewing is it still necessary? Does it add value? Does it help you get towards the end goal? Um, so you don't want people to just go through the motions of these 20 things. Um, you should have points in the year where you're kind of reviewing and often trying to optimize and find ways to streamline those tasks to enable you to close the month um, as quickly as possible. You know, that definitely that's so true. Like you kind of get into this rut because it happens every month, right? And you're just like doing it every single month, doing it exactly the same. But definitely like the way to get better is just incremental and iterations for sure. Great point. Um, I think that's all the questions. Oh, sorry. I did not scroll down. <laughs> uh, there's a few more questions. Uh, so Chris has got questions about um, suggestions of building a good interface between sales and finance, integrating CRM systems and making sure all that information is conveyed. Um, he's currently in the process of trying to revamp the process of how successful sales gets booked and how all the right information gets collected to invoice correctly. Ooh, that's quite a big one. <laughs> I might defer to you first, Abby, before I kind of <laughs> say that. 
So I just yeah, <laughs> it is it is a big one, and and so I think there's a component that I probably can't touch on. But I think from the sound of the question, it sounds like um, Christopher. It sounds like you are mapping out the process, and for me, I think that's one of the key um, the key steps. And you've already touched on it earlier in your presentation, where you emphasize the fact that the system isn't going to solve the problems of garbage in and garbage out and i've um in my career i've probably done six or seven different types of system implementations and the bulk of the work is usually on the data cleansing and the transformation you need to perform before you get the data from a to b and so making sure you've spent enough time going through that process on paper where you've mapped it out and you understand where is it current, currently falling over because yes, a system can help to automate certain elements of it, but it won't change the underlying culture if people aren't maybe filling in all six fields that they need to fill in every time a sales completed, for example. So it's just making sure you're not um, relying solely on the system to solve the problems if some of the problems aren't just about the tech um, it might be around um, the accuracy it might be around resourcing sometimes you have tasks sitting in the wrong place um, and it might be um, around the culture in terms of how how much people value um, the inputs and making sure that that translates into the right information coming out the other end um, sorry if that doesn't answer your question specifically um, but yeah, I th I'm not sure I can add too much to that on the specifics of, of choosing um, the right CRM system and integrating um, things because there's so many varieties. We currently um, have a custom built in-house um, system. I've worked with a multitude of CRMs and um, I've found that the data integrity is the biggest issue, um, not necessarily the tech choice. Yeah, and I would agree with that as well. Like the most common problem I've seen happen actually is um, the sales and the finance team basically disagreeing on terminologies. Um, so the first thing I would like, I would definitely suggest doing is just getting clear on what, on, and on whether people are people know what they're talking about. So again, I constantly have conversations where it would be like, oh yeah, I sent out the invoice. And then you're like, oh, but like the invoice hasn't gone through. Like, I mean, like, how did you do it? You don't even have access to zero. And it turns out that the sales person actually meant, I've sent out a quote. I've sent out a proposal. Um, so I, even that very simple conversation at the beginning to be like, let's be clear on what a sale is. Because again, a common um, confusion there is like a booking. So again, uh, salespeople like are very driven by bookings and bookings are basically just literally the value of invoices raised. But then for the finance team, like mm, bookings is important obviously, but um, revenue is also quite important for us. Um, so being very clear that like, oh, by the way, bookings is this, and this is revenue and being very clear to the, the finance to sales team as well, like how that works as well. Um, where you would get mistrust is where like the sales team is basically questioning the numbers from finance. Again, have seen it happen a few too many times now. Um, and like to kind of make sure that doesn't happen, like you just want to make sure they're both on the same team and they absolutely understand. Like, you know, if I say revenue, this is what I mean. If I say booking, this is what I mean. Um, so just being clear on that. The other thing to add to sorry, that really quick. Oh, sorry, go on. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the other thing to add really quickly, I think kind of echoing what Abby said about data structuring uh, or data integrity rather. Um, it's, it's, it's just that like, you know, it's um, you want to kind of make it super simple for the, the finance team to input the information. So, you know, it's oftentimes that's the sole reason as to why you have um, systems that don't line up is because like they just they don't know what numbers and stuff to put in. So go on. Yes. Add. Yes. And I was just going to add one one small point. A, a simple mapping table can make all the difference. Um, you know, you might have five accounts in zero that combined um, total the one account that you see in your CRM system. Um, and if you just have a simple mapping table as an appendix, for example, when you're sharing um, the numbers that are coming out of zero. It helps the person who's living and breathing the CRM all day to shift gears and, and understand what they're looking at when they see that, that financial um, that's being referred to. So I think sometimes things like that just to help to bridge the gap between um, the different functions. Um, great. And then the next question is from Anna, which um, I think um, her question is really around 
yeah, like I think what Abby, you touched on about the difference between a slick and a hacky solution. Um, and she's looking for advice on how you might evaluate this and how to put simple business cases as well um, to choose. And the context behind it is that they're looking to automate their usage-based billing. And obviously that's quite a big job. Um, and, you know, the simplest solution would be to stick with manual processes, which is obviously, I say free, but, you know, it takes time, but free. Or, or something, you know, crazy like um, Catholic, for example, that costs upwards of 75K a year. So trying to figure out which one works and, you know, and then deciding what the recommendation should be as well. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. And I think um, because there will always be competing priorities across the business, it can be a challenge. Um, I, it sounds like you're already on the right track in terms of understanding the problem. You understand what the, how much the solution will cost. I think utilizing your network to um, speak to people who have implemented the solutions you're thinking, thinking about, because sometimes um, different systems can perform better at you know problem a versus problem b and people that have been through that journey can tell you whether you know they got 70 percent of what they were looking for when they went through the process or you know 90 percent of what they're looking for so that's part of it um, and then i think the other part is just prioritization as an organization where there has to be leadership that cares about operations as a whole um, because I know obviously we're trying to, you know, you're trying to grow a business, you're trying to generate revenue, um, but the way the business operates is fundamental to that. Um, and there has to be leadership um, that really care about that. And so when they're looking at, at prioritization across the business, um, there has to be an approach that not only looks at what's driving revenue, but also looks at efficiency, scalability, profitability, um, so that you can prioritize initiatives like the one you're looking at um, and rank them. And if you're number four on that list, then at least you know when you'll get down to that point, um, rather than constantly thinking this is something good to do, but not knowing when it might actually happen. So I think making sure that there's a good way of prioritizing projects across the organization that's not just focused on what's going to bring in more revenue, um, because yeah, the, the operations, being more efficient, it is part of that, that journey to, to being scalable. Yeah, and I would just add as well that uh, what might be quite helpful when thinking about this is thinking what the trigger points at each phase might be as well, because it might, because you're a simple, like the hacky solution, the manual solution would work now, but it's worth thinking about when would it start breaking, I guess, um, because actually it's, it's a journey really that you're taking as well, because what you don't want to be doing is building, you know, you don't want to grow too fast. Sorry, you don't want to be paying like a 75K solution when actually a free solution would work really well. But at some point, the 75K solution would be super helpful to have. So working out at what point is that going to, what triggers they are so that you can kind of make that jump, definitely. Um, yeah. And actually, yeah, really good point. Because yeah, you, the, the knowledge of the kind of volumes and um, that you're talking about can help to kind of quantify whether whether the numbers you're looking to spend feel like they're in the right in the right region. Yeah, and I guess another quick point about putting simple business cases together, I guess. Um, I think a lot of operational people are quite analytical. You know, you're, you're quite a, logis a logician, I guess. You're trying to like rationalize the decision. I would probably suggest going down the emotional angle um, because actually when you're selling to founders, um, it's actually the emotion that counts. If you think about how like, um, the found like founders would tend to pitch and pitch to investors and it's very much based on this like amazing dream i mean it's basically how we work got its funding right i mean if you look at the fundamentals of we work you, you would never have invested in them but obviously the founder did a really good job in selling so that would be my only quick kind of like if you want to put together a business case if you want to convince management team to go for it maybe like the emotional angle around like well if you don't do this like the whole company might collapse in six months time do you really want that to happen a bit bold i like to see people try it and let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, okay, cool. And I think we've got one more question from Rafaela. And the question is around just how do you put together numbers from companies in different currencies? Um, and basically, how do you deal with exchange rates um, that obviously changes on a month to month basis? Um, and yeah, I think that's basically the question, which to be honest, is actually more a question that would be appropriate for our next um, event. Um, but I can give you a quick answer about how I've seen this work. Um, you probably need to have an input tab, which just has FX in it. 
um, and to be able to do like a lookup to that tab. And that way you can deal with the different exchange rates. Um, but obviously in terms like that is a spreadsheet problem. So I would maybe defer it to Julie, who's going to do the next session. So also that will be a good way for you to sign up for the next one as well. Jim. I yes. know it's a good segue as well to, to wrap things up. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Javern and Abby, for, uh, for doing this. This has been an incredible session. And I have recently started looking after finance in, my, in, in, the, new, in the company that I have just recently joined. So this has been super helpful. A lot of very, very actionable, uh, actionable tips. Um, and yes, thank you so much for mentioning our next event, which is going to be on um, financial planning and uh, fundraising and is going to be led by Julie Oye, who is currently finance director at WeGift. And, um, and she was at Monzo before. She was one of the people who, um, who built their finance team from scratch. So it's going to be a very, very interesting session. Um, keep an eye on our LinkedIn, on Eventbrite, uh, on our mailing list for, um, for our next events. And yes, once again, thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. Abby, Javern, thank you so much for leading the session. Um, and I'm sure we will probably see you uh, very soon in the upcoming sessions too. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. We're going to leave the chat open for, for a bit in case anyone wants to say something else. Um, but everyone have a great evening and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Awesome. This is the awkward bit where the <laughs> thing is finished and we just like hang out.